I was at work and I heard the song in my head. At that point, I just wanted to get home to lay it into my sequencer before I forgot it. Now, I had a sequencer called a Yamaha QX1. I just heard piano and the basic groove and I just got home and I got that down. Hey everyone, welcome. Final day of IMS. Hope you've all been having an amazing time. Today we're incredibly honored to be joined by uh, Marshall Jefferson, widely known as one of the founding fathers of um, electronic music. He's a man that needs really little introduction, but uh, we'll give it a little one anyway. So hailing from the birthplace of house music in Chicago, it's safe to say that his impact can still be felt today, which is an incredible feat when you consider that your track was made in a pre-door era. So welcome Marshall and thank you for joining us. How are you uh, doing today? I'm all right. Thanks. We're super excited, you know, today to be diving into the making of such an iconic track. So let's take it back to that blank canvas of creativity. Where were you when you began making the track? And was there a particular vision or was there a moment of inspiration that catalyzed you to make this record? I was at work and I heard the song in my head. And uh, at that point, I, I just wanted to get home to lay it into my uh, sequencer before I forgot it. Now I had a sequencer called a Yamaha QX1. I just heard piano and, and uh, you know, the, the groove, the basic groove, and, and I, I just got home and I, I got that down. So my process at that time was, I wasn't really a musician, but I couldn't afford to pay pay keyboard players. So I, I had to play everything myself. So this is how we, a lot of us wrote our music back in the day in Chicago. We couldn't afford to pay key, keyboard players, right? And, uh, but we wanted to get our ideas down. So uh, play the click. Okay, now. Play it back at 122. Now it's still a little choppy there, right? And, and what happened, the Yamaha QX1, it had a horrible quantize feature, right? So you couldn't really quantize, it was like really chop it up and it, it was, wasn't very musical. So uh, I, I quantized nothing, but that's the basic thing. I recorded, recorded at the slower speed and I'd speed it up to 120. Right, so and, and when it sped up to 120, every, everybody said, "Oh, fuck, Marsha could really play keyboard good." I said, "Ha ha 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 ha!" Right, but I, you know, I couldn't really play that well as you could see then. But you could edit out all the mistakes, and uh, if by chance it sounded kind of, uh, if it sounded kind of choppy like that. Miraculously, the Yamaha QX1 had a note lengthening feature. It would blanket lengthen every note on, on a track. It'd take 30 minutes to do, but it would do it. It was a really miraculous thing. It would make it sound natural, even though you sped it up from 60 because, it, you know. But I actually, I, at that time, I was just beginning, so I would record it at 40. I really had to lengthen the notes, but I, uh, you know, after a while, I knew exactly how much to lengthen the notes when, you know, when I sped things up. And a lot of my friends, uh, you know, would come over and, you know, they, I'm smarter than Marshall, I can do it too, you know. I, and <laughs> a lot of people from Chicago, they did the same thing. They played at the slower speed and sped it up. I got the idea from Led Zeppelin. People don't get mad at me for saying this, but Led Zeppelin's first album, Led Zeppelin 1, I was in rock and roll, right? It was at the normal speed, right? They recorded it and mixed it at normal speed. Every subsequent album, they sped up. They recorded it at a slower speed and sped it up to make themselves sound like better musicians. And Robert Plant, his actual voice was a, uh, you need cool and you need cool and right but when it came out on record it, you need cool and you know he had to do ver various compensations for, for that you know but you could even he hear it i could hear it in the timbre of the drums and the and the pitch and i i went to see led zeppelin live a good example of this if you're into rock music is if you listen to led zeppelin the song remains the same on spotify or title or apple music and you watch the movie the movie is much slower, timber is lower, it's, you know, the pitch is lower, and, you know, they sped up 
the recording, the album from the movie. So you could, you could actually hear that if you play them side by side. You know, I heard this from the first, second Al Led Zeppelin album, you know. So cut to uh, 84 when I got my equipment, the, the, the Yamaha QX1. My friend, he was a guitarist. He needed a ride to Guitar Center, which is a music store in Chicago, right? So, you know, I drove in the Guitar Center and the sales guy, he was showing him this Yamaha QX1. He said, with this sequencer, you could play keyboards like Stevie Wonder, even if you don't know how to play at all. I said, wow, you know, you know, my friend, he's a get guitarist. I said, Man, don't believe that. You know, you got to practice. You got to put in work. I believe I'm going to buy it, right? He said, well, where you work at? Uh, you got a job? I said, yeah, I work at the post office. Said, Ding. So it gave, gave me a big credit line, a, a $10,000 credit line. So I got the QX1. I'm ready to walk out the door. He said, wait a minute. You need to buy a keyboard. I said, what? I said, yeah, it, it's a sequencer. It sequences keyboards. It plays back keyboards. If you don't have any, a keyboard, you won't hear anything. I thought, oh, yeah, you're right. So I bought the keyboard. He said, yeah, you know, you know you need a drum machine, too, to help you keep your timing. I said, yeah, I do need a drum machine. So, <laughs> so I bought the drum machine, right? And he said, hey, you, know, you need a mixer to, so you could hear everything at the same time. I said, well, I'm a DJ. I got a mixer already. He said, no, you need a recording mixer. Said, you can hear eight tracks at the same time with this. I said, yeah, I need a recording mixer, right? <laughs> so I got that, right? So I got all this stuff, uh, you know, long story short. And the last thing I got was something they couldn't basically give away for $150. It was this thing called a TB303, right? So I got that. So I'm, I'm all set to go. And I got home, and my boy, he was nice enough to call all my friends and invite them over and watch me and stuff. And they, uh, they took the piss out of me for like about five hours. A stupid sucker bought all this stuff, don't even know how to play. <laughs> I felt like I was about like an inch taller when they got through with me. But I wrote my first song two days later because I knew exactly how I was going to do it. I was going to record at the slower speed like Led Zeppelin and speed it up. Of course, I sped it up a lot more than Led Zeppelin did, but I was a lot less talented than they were. I was coming from complete novice musician. I didn't know how to play nothing, no musical training whatsoever. I, I'm coming from scratch, right? So I'm playing at, at 40 and, and, I, and I speed it up. Boom, 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 boom. Speed it up to 120, boom, 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 boom. I said, whoa, I got it now, right? So I make music. I, I did two songs. I did uh, this song called I've Lost Control with Sleazy D. And I did that with the, the, the TB303. And I did this other song called Under You. It was called The Pleasure Exchange at the time. And I gave it to Ron Hardy and he played them. And, and that was it. I, I started like giving a song to him a week. And, and people would come back to me because I was working the graveyard shift at the post office, which was midnight to 8.30 a.m. every day. You know, music box was open from midnight to noon. After work, I was knackered. I wasn't going to no party, man. I was just, I just wanted to go home and, you know. I gave the tapes, the reel to reel tapes and cassettes to my friend Sleazy, who did I've Lost Control. And Sleazy blew up in the music box where Ron Hardy was playing it. He was a celebrity there. Everybody thought he was doing the music. Eventually, I got, uh, got out there. And, Basically, I slow, I play at the slower speed and I speed it up. Anybody could do it. Americans seem to pick it up pretty quickly. Europeans seem to have a lot less confidence than uh, Americans for some reason. Like, for instance, I could do a vocal session in the UK and the singers, I got to sing it again. I got to sing it again. It, it, and it'll be an 11 hour session and they got to have the vocals perfect, right? While an American, he'll go in there, one take, he'll screw up every note, and he can come out and say, ain't that the greatest shit you ever heard in your life? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so like, <laughs> there's a confidence. As a matter of fact, that, that confidence gap also happens in production. Like some of the women producers, like way more talented than guys, you know, they, oh, it's not good enough. You know, I, I can't do... I can't do music. I don't, uh, yeah, you know, the guys just hop up there, put any old shit. Down. Blah, blah, blah. All right, I'm jamming, you know. But that's how it is. It's a confidence gap. I would come out to the UK and I'd do it. I'd say, yeah, you could do this too. And, and uh, say, oh, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. And they'd go out and hire a keyboard player anyway. I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so were the vocals done in one take then with uh, your friend Curtis? Yeah, vocals were done in one take. 
And do you remember how long it actually took to make the track from beginning to end? Well, actually, no. He he had a, a slight problem singing the Gotta Have House on the on the drum roll, right? But after that, he was able to go straight because I wanted him to have it on the drum roll. Boom, 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 gotta have house. After that, he, he was able to go straight through. And tell us a bit more about this whole process, like why him, um, did, the lyric, did, he, did he come up with the lyrics? What inspired that? Well, I came up with the lyrics on the spot, but we all worked at the post office. Uh, there was Curtis, he sang the lead vocals. Then there's Rudy Forbes, he sang background vocals, and Thomas Carr sang background vocals, and we, we called ourselves on the house. I was also on background vocals. And uh, Curtis became the lead singer by default because he was always singing lead on the job while we were working. You know, he would like replace like popular songs with obscene lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, Billy Jean is not much, she's just a hoe who, uh, you know, and, and it was funny, but but he was singing lead on the, on the job, so, you know, but he was like, oh, he was joking, right? So, like, when it came time to sing lead on all, all, all of On the House's stuff, you know, Curtis was the lead singer. And Curtis also taught me uh, a lot of DJ tricks. We had this guys called the Hot Mix Five in Chicago on the radio, and they would do tricks. They would play 40 songs an hour, and they would backspin and repeat and phase on every song. It was the greatest radio mixing I've ever heard in my life, and Curtis knew how to do all the tricks. So he was a DJ. He don't want anybody to know that, but he taught me all the DJ tricks. We were both DJs, and when Move Your Body came out, he said, man, don't tell anybody we're DJs and stuff. I said, why? Oh man, we you know it's it's all DJs now. We got we got to be different. So, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know these days it almost feels like tracks that um, you know ha talk about house music in itself is a is a little genre in itself. But you know you were you were there in Chicago in those in those seminar f first uh, days. What was that like? What was house? What did house music mean to you at that point? The main goal was a safe party. The warehouse was. It was known throughout the city as a gay club, and Frankie Knuckles was the DJ there. When people would say house music, it was, you know, the gangsters would stay clear of the party because, you know, house music, oh, that's, I ain't going in there, you know, that's gay, that's gay stuff, you know, right? But so it would be all races on one dance floor, all music on one dance floor, be what is now known as techno on the same dance floor. You, you'd you have like Frequency 7 by Visage and, you, and you'd have Martin Circus and, and you know, different dance genres, subgenres. It was one dance floor and you would hear European music and Philadelphia and New York, you know, don't make me wait, you know, Peach Boys and visual and, and stuff like that. And they would all be playing on one dance floor. And it was, oh, it's beautiful. So that's, that's what I try to duplicate with, with my parties uh, now. I try not to stick to one subgenre all night. You know, I think that's the most boring thing imaginable. I, I like dynamics, you know, you know, something, you know. I like the record sounded as different from the last record that I play as possible. People talk about harmonic keys, you know, I... <laughs> I don't want the last record sounding like the new record. I want people to know when a new record is coming on. The house scene at that time, it was like nothing I've ever seen. For one thing, a lot of black kids that weren't gay were pretending to be gay. You know, it was, it was the craziest thing. Little history here. Chicago, the last decade, they, they say we had more gun murders in Afghanistan. The reason for that is uh, in the early 70s, uh, the Chicago Police Department put out a directive to eradicate all the gangs in Chicago. So they, so they literally either murdered or put them in jail. And I know this from two perspectives. One, my father was a cop and he quit after they killed Fred Hampton from the Black Panthers. And they were bragging about it when they did it. Oh, we got that notice. Also, my cousin Bobby Rush was set second in command of the Black Panthers. So he became the leader of the Black Panthers when Fred Hampton got killed. So I, I knew it from two perspectives. What happened after that year, they, they either killed or put Chicago gang leaders in jail because what happened was the Black Panthers tried to unite all the gangs in Chicago. And, and uh, instead of them fighting each other, they, 
it would be like a peaceful situation. And uh, when they eradicated all the, the gang leadership, the gang splintered to the present situation is still here after 50 plus years is there's a different gang on every block now. You walk to the next block and you'll get shot. You know, so that's what the situation is in Chicago right now. You know, kids get caught in the crossfire and all that stuff, right? We hate rap in Chicago because that means somebody's going to shoot up the club. You, you have metal detector searching. Somebody's going to slip a gun in there for some reason. Goes, you stepped on my Jordans. Pow, 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 pow. You know, that's the situation in Chicago. Now, with house music, you have the chosen few picnic, 50,000 plus people. You don't even need security, you know, because it's house music. So house music was the safe party and that everybody wanted to go to. You don't have to worry about anybody shooting. You don't have to worry about anybody fighting and all that. So that's what house music meant to Chicago. It was the safe party and people just went crazy. Now, by contrast, rap in New York, which came around at the same time, was the safe party. The gangs united. And they t literally told the gangs, instead of fighting, break dance. They controlled that for a while. But what happened in New, New York, the rap parties were safe because the, the rappers, the, the gangs were throwing the parties. Say if the, the Zulus threw a party and you tried to cut up there, they take you in the back and your friends won't see you anymore. No cutting up, you know, the gangs will behave themselves and every, and that was a safe party in New York. So that's how hip hop blew up in New York but it's not like that in other parts of uh, America. And that's why, you know, everybody's shooting and, and stuff. But back to house, <laughs> we had a safe party and that's how we thrived. That's how we, we had all kinds of music on one dance floor and it was Nirvana. It was great. Amazing. Wow, to be there in that time must have been incredible. Um, so when it comes to creating a hit record, there are, of course, you know, uh, many elements that need to come together perfectly. So um, how did you approach balancing all of these different components in Move Your Body? Because so many parts of this are so iconic, from the groove to the piano to the vocals. Um, do you remember that sort of uh, process of putting it all together in the arrangement? Well, I heard the song in my head, and from that point, it was just a process of getting to the end. I wasn't that much into analysis at that time. I just grew. Later on, I heard something by this so old songwriter named Irving Berlin from the 30s, and he defined a hit. He said, easy to sing, easy to say, easy to remember. And that's what he called a hit. So that Move Your Body, I believe, has all those in ingredients, like the, the one verse it has is easy to remember. But one of the most uh, astonishing things about this record um, is that initially it received a negative reception, not only from your friends, but um, also from the label owner, Larry Sherman, who proclaimed it wasn't the house music. Um, that's crazy. But yeah, of course, it became, you know, unstoppable um, in the Chicago club scene. Um, and it led to, you, you know, titling the track, the house music anthem. So what was that whole, you know, journey and that release process like for you? Well, I gave the song to Ron Hardy right after we recording, I took it to Mike Dunn, uh, Hugo Hutchison, and Tyree Cooper, who were li literally living at this club called the Sheba mm -hmm. in Chicago. So they, they played it on the uh, sound system at the Sheba. And just, oh, yeah, this is all right. This is all right, you know. But they weren't, like, really going crazy for it. So then I took it down to the music box with Ron Hardy, and I played it on my car sound system for Joe Smooth and K. Alexi and some other people. And, uh, you know, they said, oh, that's all right. You know, and they weren't too excited about it either. So then I get, gave it to Ron Hardy, and Ron Hardy played it like six times in a row by the, it, you know, that, by the end of the, that thing. Everybody was going nuts. And, ah! I said, yeah, that's what I was expecting. Ron Hardy said, don't give this to anybody else. I said, got you, right? I'm not going to give it to anybody else. But my friend Sleazy, who I mentioned earlier, he was the king of the music box, right? But he wanted to get in Frankie Knuckles Club, the power plant for free. So Sleazy gave Frankie Knuckles a copy, right? <laughs> so at that time, Frankie had like this network. He would make tapes of his sets and the whole city would get them. Like, it would be a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, right? But the, about at least like 10,000 people would get cassettes of his set by the end of the week. So after that, Frankie's best friend was Larry LeVan from New York. So he gave Larry LeVan a copy. So Larry LeVan got a, a copy of this, started blowing up in New York. I started getting calls from 
New York want me to come out there to perform and the record wasn't even out. I said, uh, I don't know what to do. I don't, you know, I, so so I, I said, no. Somehow, Alfredo from Ibiza got a copy and he started playing it in Ibiza. From Ibiza, some British DJs got copies of it and started playing it in the UK. So uh, the next thing I know, people are calling me up, you know, wanting to interview me, you know, with this British accent. I thought it was my friends taking the piss, you know. Was, <laughs> you know, so we were like, that's a, uh-huh. And then they, uh, uh, this herd of reporters flew to Chicago, wanting to ask about house music. You know, cause songs that gotta have house music, gotta have, you know, but that house music. And a chip, chip E had a song out called It's House, It's House, It's House, right? So the record still wasn't out yet. You know, because, uh, well, I paid Larry Sherman $1,500 to press up a thousand copies for me. And he didn't do it, you know, because he just, he was just like, oh, this piece of shit, it's not gonna do anything, I, uh, right? So they started interviewing all these guys in Chicago, uh, you know, Fast Eddie and, and Farley and Chip about house music and, and Steve Silver Hurley about house music. And then they got around to Larry Sherman. Larry's like, I know all about house music. I, I know everything about house music, right? Larry took him to like about four clubs in Chicago and every club uh, he took them to, to as soon as Move Your Body came on, everybody like, ah, ah, right? And, uh, and Larry, oh, Larry owned the record pressing plant. The very next day, after eight months, he pressed Move Your Body in a day and it was out the next day, but it came out on Tracks Records. It didn't come out on uh, my label. That's another story. <laughs> But uh, why did you choose not to release it on your own label? I didn't choose not to. I, he chose not to. He owned the pressing plant and he saw how people were reacting to it. He pressed it up. And not only didn't he press it up on my label, he, he put me down as the artist. And that's very important because we had a group called On the House. It was supposed to come out under On the House, right? So like, oh man. Boys came over and they were pissed off. They said, hey man, you put your name on right now. I said, man, I didn't do it. I said, I give you the address. You go down your, there yourself and talk to him. He, he put it out under my name. He, he didn't put it out on my label. Go down there and talk to him, right? So yeah, well, that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do, right? Larry said, Marshall's name is on there. Uh, I don't know you. Kiss my ass, right? <laughs> Right, so they came back. And, oh, man, he's scandalous, man. He don't, 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 don't. So, oh, uh, we had this friend named Norman Davis. He said, "Well, why don't y'all get Marshall to sign an affidavit saying y'all sang on the record, right?" So we went and got the uh, affidavit of the notary, and and uh, you know they took that down. And, yeah, see, we did sing on the record. We, we, we sang. So, so Larry said, yeah, you know why I put Marshall's name on there? It's because he signed a contract and I gave him $150,000. Uh, you know, he said, did he give you any of that money? Of course, you know, they came in, hey man, he gave you $150,000, where's our cut? I said, he didn't give me $150,000, boys. <laughs> you know, long story short, they signed a contract with Trax Records and, uh, you know, all kind of problems happen. Now, the monumental success of this record has defined so many things for the culture of house music. Um, as you look back at it, what's the, one of the most uh, surprising or unexpected things um, about, you know, this success for you? I was expecting it to be big because it was a house music anthem, right? I called it the house music anthem. I said, gotta have house. I was thinking of Bill Haley, Rock Around the Clock. And we're going to rock around the clock. I said, Daddy, they're going to play this for years and years, right? <laughs> That's how I thought, right? That, that, that everybody, oh, I never would have expected it. No, nah, I was expecting it. I, I thought there was going to be a house music hall of fame and I would be the very first inductee, you know? <laughs> but... <laughs> That's what I was expecting, right? But, it, it, you know, it would be like rock and roll and it would evolve. Uh, but it didn't turn out like that. 
Well, it turned out it turned out amazing. I mean, you know, it's, it's it has it's still iconic. It still is being played everywhere. It's still it still paved the way. I mean, how many producers have stolen those chords? Uh, you know that you've played as well. Um, but I'm aware that we're uh, <coughs> running out of time. So I would love um, for the, if the audience have any questions. Damn, to ha out of I know <laughs> time flies fast. I told fun. you I talked a lot. <laughs> But yeah, if, um, we've got a question at the front. Hello, my name is Sean. Uh, have you ever met uh, Alfredo in Ibiza life, in real life? Alfredo? Yes. Yeah, I met him, I met him a couple of times. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. I met Larry LeVan, a lot of people, a lot of DJs, a lot of big day DJs. Uh, I'm, I'm confused. Did you ever get a dime out of this whole thing, from what you're saying? Out of Move Your Body? Yes. Well, recently, yeah, uh, my publishers, uh, He's straightened out a lot of business uh, on that song and a lot, of, a lot of my back catalog. So I've gotten money recently, but nothing before uh, the 2000s. Nothing. Hey, how are you doing? Thanks so much for sharing your story. Amazing, brilliant, inspiring. <laughs> um, you spoke a lot about the tracks that are being played and shared internationally. What I would like to know is where's your favorite place you've heard it? Like, where, where's the biggest moment for you where you, see, you, know, you knew it was going to be good, right? And I love that you knew that. That's amazing. But where did you hear it or see it play and think, fuck, yeah? Uh, you, you mean around the world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like where's, where's a really oh, pivotal moment? To, that's hard to say. Uh, I got a big response in Russia in an ice skating rink, I think. <laughs> Israel is really wild. Ireland is off the hook. You know, Ireland, oh man, they party in Ireland. And Croatia, oh man, Croatia, yeah, well, how, do, how could I forget Croatia? Uh, when I first went there, it was right after the war finished. And uh, I played a set there, and I believe the Croatian football team had just come in second in the World Cup or something like that. And uh, my party was completely empty. I, I got the new Pioneer mixer the DJ M500, and I was doing all kinds of tricks on it. You know, I was just playing around because nobody was at the party. It was completely empty, right? I went back home, back home and stuff. I said, oh, well, you know. And uh, they got me back six months later, and apparently they recorded my set, and they were playing it through the whole of Croatia. And uh, I went to this club called Aurora, and I got there, and it was like about 5,000 people waiting outside that couldn't get into the party, right? I said, oh, what's going on here, right? You know, I got out of the car and I, I was the only black person there. You know, so everybody started cheering. I said, what? Oh, they're cheering for me, right? So like, <laughs> I got out there and went in the club. Everybody started cheering as I got out on, onto the, into the uh, DJ box and previous DJ immediately got out of the way to go ahead and play. I said, okay. You know, I played and when it got to move your body, bah, right, this viral before the internet. But it was, uh, they were selling tapes of my set in, in the stores and stuff, but it was really, really, really good. Thank you. Um, hey, um, I just wanted to ask, is there anything from the production process that you miss or like a piece of equipment that you used to use in the process that you kind of miss in the production? In the production? Oh, yeah, I missed all my equipment that I, that I used. But like, if you want to know specifics, let me see, for Move Your Body and a lot of my other songs, for the bass sound, I use this keyboard called uh, Roland JX-8P, right? Drums were Roland 707s, and the piano sound was a Prophet 2000. Now, the pian there are way better piano sounds today. Uh, and the Prophet 2000, if I try to play it now, it sounds horrible because the sound quality is so much better now. But on, on the crap eight track that we were recording on back then, it sounded great. It sounded like a real piano. But like, you know, I tried to buy another one and, and I used that same piano sound. I thought, huh? It's way better sound quality for pianos now. But uh, I still use the Roller JX-8P. Other songs like uh, I've Lost Control, I use the, the TB-303. And that was, you know, I bought it for $150. I wound up selling it for 1000 If I would have kept it till today, I could have sold, sold yeah. Uh, I, I sold it to my friend Bam Bam for $1,000. Uh, and he, he, he based his whole label on it. You know, uh, Westbrook Records, he did uh, Where's Your Child and, and uh, Give It To Me. And... Uh, 
you know, and the Armando stuff, you know, he, he did a lot of that stuff on TV 303. A few years ago, about eight years ago, he wanted, he, he put it on eBay because I signed the bottom of it. Biz got up to $10,000 and he pulled it. I said, why'd you pull it, man? He said, he said, I'm going to sell it in about five years. I'm, I'm going to get 50 grand for it. I said, no, you ain't. I said, you better get the 10 now, right? So he, he kept it and, uh, he split up with his girlfriend and nobody knows where it is now. <laughs> you know, hey, where's my TV thrill there? I don't know. You know, so, <laughs> you know, that's what, that's what time it is. Well, talking about the time, we have to end it. Thank you so okay. much, Marshall. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>